So some quick little update. Uh, past couple of weeks have not been the best couple of weeks for me. I've just been uh, suffering through burnout, just exhaustion, stuff like that too. And it, it was just not fun to be in that little mindset like last week too, especially going forward into you know the second the like not the second week of February, but like the first week of February just being like like in that very crappy little mindset and especially as an actor uh, or performer what have you dealing with burnout is just not like the 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 key to do like dealing with burnout it's it's always going to be like that but at the same time it's like at the same time yeah like literally at the same time there are performers who are able to essentially work with the burnout and then just like somehow still make things work but yeah but for, but for me I, I just need like essentially like a week to essentially uh recalibrate and sure enough like i am sort of like recalibrated if that's a word but burnout is still like one of those things that are i mean that is literally it's literally hard to describe so you know there's days where i feel like oh the burnout's gone away and there's probably uh days where the burnout has yet to really gone away but as of right now i'm feeling i'm feeling up to it again so yeah uh yeah uh point one for uh mental health um but yeah hayden how was your uh like uh, past couple of weeks it was good like honestly i've been kind of feeling like a similar kind of burnout um with like you know my writing so it's like so i think how we took a week off in the weekly readings as well for that so i could because honestly if we didn't and the burnout happened i'd be like oh no yeah, yeah so it, it, it's like yeah you do kind of have to just like because burnout's going to happen, so it's like when it does happen, because you, you can't predict it, so when it does happen, you kind of have to just, like, take a step back from whatever you're doing that's causing that burnout. Just take a take a couple days, just, you know, do something else. Watch a, watch a good movie, TV show, or just, just anything else you enjoy doing. And then that way you can just kind of, you know, come back into doing what you enjoy doing with a more, you know, fresher head, you know. Yeah, and I that's what I essentially did was like last week was not only catch up with uh like movies I needed to watch or just like movies that, that have been on my back burner to watch and stuff like that too. Like I you know, I watched the Mitchells versus the Machines and then I and then a Canto and then what was it? Uh, a couple of days later I went actually to my first uh off Broadway production in over two years. Hmm. So nice. Yeah, uh, and that was excellent to do because I haven't been in a Broadway theater. I mean, yeah, I have been in Broadway theaters or off-Broadway th- theaters. You know, the last time I was in an off-Broadway theater was this uh, was th- this uh, Midtown theater that we both know of, the, the Producers Club. But instead of going to see a friend's show or something like that, it was a uh, one night showing up like short films and everything. And of course... Anyone who's in who's been inside the producers club knows how tiny the seats are and stuff like that too. And and, and being and not so tiny, but just how like old those seats are too. Oh yeah. But the the they did like do some uh, renovations on some of those theaters oh. too, so it actually feels a lot more better than it was previously. But the bar good. itself actually looks a lot more uh, like a, a bar rather than just <laughs> being like almost like most tavern, you know, like like. <laughs> Like I joke, it, but... like it, it looks like something that was just kind of like thrown together because they had enough space for it almost. Yeah, but now, now the uh, like there's actually a bar, like a bar space, and also a little lounge space. So yeah, it, I mean it looks nice, but being in a theater space, you know, again, especially after over two years and actually seeing your show. It lit that spark in me again, and that's probably the reason why I'm not feeling as crappy as I was previously. Oh, that's awesome. But, but yeah, with the but yeah, speaking of Encanto and Mitchell's versus Machines, the big story 
that came out today, they released the Oscar uh, nominations. And, and of course, the day before, they released the uh, Razzie nominations. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, out of respect of the Oscars, we'll talk, we'll be, we were talking about the Oscar nominations uh, to, uh, and versus the Razzie nominations today. Which is which is funny because like almost like a month and a half ago, yeah, a month and a half ago we did our own like world best and worst thing of like 2021. But here's the actual official uh, thing. So the best picture. Now, of course, with the Oscars, I'm not going through every single freaking category. That'll take like a long time to do it. And I, like, we'll, I, we'll, we'll probably be here for like two hours if we try to do that and try yeah, to discuss all of it. Yeah, so we're just going to do like the, uh, uh, the obviously important characters that are like there. Mm -hmm. All right. So starting with the best picture. And again, they're still doing the, uh, I believe, the 12 best pictures. Hang on. One, two, three, four. No, I think it's 10. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, 10. Because for the past, like, say, several years, the Oscars have been trying to shoe in more, like, best picture things because, you know, six or five or whatever it was previously, it just wasn't, like, you know, it just wasn't, uh, it just wouldn't uh, be, uh, like. It just feels too short when it's, like, you have a full year of, like, so many movies that came out. All right. So the best picture the you know the best picture things are I mean the best picture nominees are Belfast, Coda, Don't Look Up, Drive My Car, Dune, King Richard, Licorice Peacher, Nightmare Alley, The Power The Power of the Dog, and West Side Story. Uh, out of all the ones I saw, the one that kind of struck out to me was probably. Ooh. Hmm. Which probably don't look up. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, it does feel like an Oscar bait movie, especially mm -hmm. when you have like Leonardo DiCaprio, Jennifer Lawrence, uh, Meryl Streep, a bunch of others in there. And then, but when you look at some of the uh, like the reviews or it, like a lot of the people who want the movie who both praised it and also wants it have point out it is very hard to watch because of it because it doesn't know if it wants to be a satire or an actual like uh uh like a warning like one of those type of warning pictures like i forgot what it's called but it's uh mm -hmm. like it's like it's almost a like a critique of literally what's going on yeah. right now in reality yeah, and I, and I feel like that's yeah. I, th I think that's kind of the biggest like problem, and I won't say the, like it's a problem in the sense that like you know it's a bad movie, but it's just more like why I like because I actually didn't watch the movie because like everything I heard about it, I'm like you know saying it wants to be a satire, but I'm like so it's basically just essentially what we have already gone through, but instead of COVID, it's a meteor. Yeah. So it's like. And it's just like, it, I think it wants to be satire, but it's like, it feels almost like now it's just like, what is even satire anymore? When when everything that was was supposed to be satire has now become reality. Yeah. That's and kind I, of the tricky thing where it's like, you know, yes, I, I get the message of the movie, but... It's also just like reminding us of like literally all the frustrations that we have had to deal with for the past two freaking years and still having to deal with now. Yeah, like a good counterpoint with that is that, uh, you know, the Broadway show, not Broadway show, the off Broadway show. I keep saying Broadway show by uh, and got Broadway. Broadway on the brain. Yeah, I know. The off Broadway show that I saw, uh, Ten Bone and Bones, is a satire slash musical of two characters trapped in a minstrel show, right? And it's basically about these two characters who gain sentence, and then suddenly, instead of it being them trapped in a minstrel show, it's like Lim, like literally taking over the narrative of the show, and then as the show comes along, it basically, show, it's basically almost like it's a satire of 
what it is being a, a black, you know, a black person, not only a, you know, a black person in America, but also just being a, you know, a BIPOC, you know, a personal color in America, but also dealing with themes like racism, brutality, especially with people in power, mm -hmm. uh, dealing with capitalism, stuff like that too, and other, like, other themes too. And not only is this done in a very satirical way, it kind of, like, throws the satire, the satire like almost out the window close to like the second act mm -hmm. where it come becomes a lot more grounded and a lot more okay you know this is you know even though it's still haha -ha, funny it's still saying like messages and stuff like that too and yeah i can understand why they gave it to don't look up because out of all the like out of all the movies that were that came out on like netflix or something like that yeah, the, the the you know, and again, like I said before, DiCaprio's in it, Meryl Streep's in it, Jennifer Lawrence in it, Timothy Salmaine's in it. Like, yeah, it, its cast is amazing. Yeah, like when your like cast is like the selling point to that movie. That's obviously why you know mm -hmm. there's other things like that too are are essentially. Nominated for an Oscar, mm -hmm. like King, like King Richard, you know, like the night, like and, and also, and also, just also, just to quickly say, like, j just to kind of finish off the the don't, the don't look up discussion a little bit. Yeah, the like type because like that show you were describing that like that off Broadway show that actually yeah. sounds brilliant. It is brilliant because it's like yeah, that's the perfect way to actually not only do the satire but then get rid of it because if the characters in it have essentially gained sentience and realize they are characters in a show. Yeah. Then yeah, of course it's gonna make sense that they're gonna throw out the satire and then it's gonna start like but just but yeah, it just sounds like a brilliant way to actually like like introduce a message and get points across through a uniquely interesting story. Yeah. Instead of just like reminding us all of literally the exact same frustrations we have just come from. In pretty much the exact same way, only really changing what's actually affecting us all. Whereas, like, instead of a pandemic, it's just a meteor. Yeah. Which, like, yeah. It's, it's like, again, what is, what is ultimately going to be the point of that movie, too, though? Because if it's satire, supposed to, like, hope maybe change someone's mind. I'm sorry, but, like, whoever, whoever like, whatever someone's mind already currently is... That movie isn't going to change anything. If anything, it might make them double down more. And the weird thing is, is that, you know, they obviously done uh, apocalyptic world ending movies before, you know, it's like, you know, it, it's obviously something that has not been, you know, done to death, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, there's movies like Deep Impact. Mm -hmm. Armageddon. Or, con or Contagion. Contagion, uh, the day after tomorrow, uh, I am Legend, mm -hmm. you know, with Will Smith. But, and, and, and of course, you know, something that just came out just, just like just this past weekend, Moonfall. It's about mm -hmm. like literally the moon like falling, even though it's not like the moon falling, it's sort of like the idea of, you know, the moon being essentially a, not really the moon and like it's sort of like some sort of like alien space station or something like that it, it, it's it's a weird plot synopsis right now but but you know the same thing happens like uh it, it it's the, the the tired old idea of and i think what also probably doesn't work about this movie too is like oh and it's something that you just talked about before is like the sign like it's sort of like almost like a uh, what's the term? A, uh, a. Uh, sorry, folks, for I'm having a brain fart. Uh, a statement on essentially where the scientists are not the like scientists are essentially not treated as being scientists, and they aren't like the ones who aren't you know saying, oh yeah, by the way, you know we're. You know, this crisis is, is, is happening. We have to start 
planning like planning our doom or whatnot and there are people who was like yeah you know we'll not think about our doom we'll just go on their lives and somehow those their lives you know that's like, like if it goes on like that then yeah that that could actually work but a lot of it i see is like typical like anna mckay type of like satire humor i see in stuff like in his past like more recent movies where it's like even my friends who love his pre you know, previous films like Step Brothers, Anchorman, Anchorman 2, mm -hmm. you know, Taga De Talladega Nights, <laughs> amazing comics. But when he tries to do something that's more serious but still has comedy stuff, mm -hmm. it doesn't really mess together. Yeah. So seeing yeah, don't yeah like know, serious like the more serious storytelling has never really been his forte because like you said, like just listing off all those movies, they're very much comedies because that is just very much what he knows to write. And and the previous like big movie that he did that was like more serious was Vice, and Vice was a thing about a uh, friggin' uh, Dick Cheney, mm. and you know, it, but people are like, I think it also has to do with uh, maybe. actors as well because sometimes it does work when certain actors are in certain roles but then it's just like it's odd it, it, like again adam mckay is a very odd person to, to talk about because mm -hmm. it, he's just trying to like trying to show that he can actually do more than just being a comedy director but even when he does like something like a satire or or a black comedy it still doesn't feel like it's still connecting with that little hook or what happened mm -hmm. yeah it feels like he just doesn't know where his flaws are in storytelling now other nominees i saw best picture i i like dune i was kind of surprised to see that because you know it's dune with the way they were doing it i was like yeah i'm pretty sure uh villain uh dennis villain villain view i hope i'm pronouncing the name correctly probably get like a best director but and I was actually looking at uh, an article that says, no, he didn't get Best Director. And we'll get into that in the next one. Mm -hmm. But uh, King Richard, I was surprised to see that because I really thought, you know, oh, yeah, Will Smith, obviously, he'll probably get, like, Best Actor. But mm -hmm. to see it underneath, like, Best Picture, that, that was actually kind of surprising because I didn't really see it as a Best Picture. I just saw it as, like, an, a, a vehicle for Will Smith to be get, like, a uh, Best Actor nomination or something. Yeah. <laughs> Also, it's like, I remember seeing a commercial for that movie, like, so many years ago, and then I see it pop up again, like, probably a year later. I'm like, and I'm just thinking, didn't this movie come out already? And then it's like, no, I guess it probably got delayed because of COVID. Yeah. And, that, and, 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 and yeah, King Richard is an odd one. I, I, I'm just seeing that, and I'm like, really, though? Yeah, uh, like, Licorice Peacher, that's easy. You know, PTA, Paul Thomas Anderson. The man is brilliant, brilliant when in the work he does. Same with Nightmare Alley and Game Eldo, uh, Game, uh, Game Eldo Toro. West Side Story, you know, Spielberg. Uh, yeah, I, I was surprised to see Coda on the list because I didn't really hear about Coda until just like maybe just recently, like maybe up until two weeks ago. And so it, it probably just shows you how how late to the game I am with some of these movies are, you know, mm -hmm. these brilliant movies that came out last year. I'm only figuring out that these brilliant movies came out last year and then <laughs> find out they're coming out like, Oh, you know, but yeah, the, like, yeah, I, like some of these, but again, some of these nominations for best picture, I expected it, but mm -hmm. again, it, it, you know, Yeah, some some are expected, some are given, some are okay. Then didn't see that coming. Yeah, like I know Spider-Man: Far From Home. I mean, Far From Home. Damn, No Way Home. You know, it obviously couldn't be Best Picture, but mm -hmm. you could easily have traded something like Don't Look Up to like Spider-Man: No Way Home for Best Picture, mm -hmm. but. Honestly, I feel like it really should be up there because it actually does tell like a compelling story of this kid who never 
really had to take responsibility in his life, essentially, actually now having to really understand what responsibility means and having to live with the repercussions of his, well, his, you know, past and ability to actually take responsibility and then now actually having to do that and having to learn yeah. what it means. You know, and... There, you know, I was surprised. Yeah, it's like I'm looking at movies that came out last year. And I think it's also, too, just because it's like there's still this, like, weird thing where it's like if it's a superhero movie, then it'll never be up there. And I don't get why, because a lot of them, yeah, they can be kind of gimmicky. So, you know, there are a lot of them where I'm like, yeah, I I wouldn't even expect this one to get an Oscar nomination in any way anyway because you know it is what it is but then there's some of them i'm like no this should get some nominations though yeah i think it just goes into the to to the point of the academy where it's just like these best picture nominations they just look so expected and bland especially going for the past few years where it's just Mm -hmm. people have been wanting more and more like variety and more inclusion and then a lot and the only thing that i i've seen that that are inclusive is probably coda drive my car and yeah probably coda and and maybe belt fast because you know from what i'm hearing it's supposed it's supposed to be a very good movie but Mm -hmm. yeah a lot of these movies are just like made by the same type of people who you would expect to be like an oscar nomination and stuff like that too it's mm-hmm. you know there's a great joke in austin powers 3 where steven spielberg is directing like the movie within the movie of austin powers and whatever like gold finger or whatever it's called mm-hmm. i know i know it's a joke on the you know i, I forgot what it was called but and austin goes like it's arguing with steven and steven like all like without without you know missing a beat just pulls out an oscar and goes do you want this and I'm like, okay fine but, and sometimes when you have like those type of like directors or people behind those productions yeah you know obviously steven spielberg i mean Sp- St- steven spielberg no matter what type of movie he's doing oh it, like oh he's got to be doing a comedy this year chances are It'll probably be mm-hmm. nominated uh, by next year as a best picture or, yeah. best, or best director. And not only that, too, but it's like then you have to just look at, like, you know, the people who do a lot of the voting for these, you know, these nominations, essentially, for what gets for what wins. It's always these, you know, older, essentially white men who are very so much entrenched in their old school way of how movies and stories should be told. So it's like, you can always then basically expect like, okay, yeah, it's going to be essentially the same kind of thing or kind of actor in a sense. That's always going to end up winning. Yeah. Because they're not going to actually go out and watch anything that's more, you know, challenging, engaging, different. They're always going to go with the, what they know, what is, you know, quote unquote, safe. Yeah. So spoilers, I don't think Don't Look Up is going to win. Well, yeah. Sorry, but I just don't see that happening because with the way these go. And if it does win, it'd be, it'd be like one of those pissed off things. So, yeah, if anything, uh, I'd probably see Liquid Peacher or probably The Power of the Dog winning. Mm-hmm. Best Picture. And both and both films with Liquid Peacher, again, Paul Thomas Anderson you know, backing that up, uh, you know, backing that production up and both as a producer and as a director. But with Powerful, Power of the Dog, I'm hearing, you know, a lot of great things about it. And Netflix has been like a, a, a juggernaut when it comes to this. And also, you know, you have Benedict Cumberbatch as the main character, like the main lead in that movie. So obviously, you know, when it comes to like, I, I think what it happens with a lot of these movies, especially with Best Picture, is uh, appeal, but also just like, yeah, just general appeal, and also just like, just general marketing. Like, which mm-hmm. film do you think would probably win Best Picture by just either production value or just the way it looks? Mm-hmm. All right. Now it's like it's like a great example. It's like you know, 
for like say the game awards last was two won pretty much everything which it shouldn't have because sorry it wasn't that inventive with its mechanics only added a few things its story sorry it's a clunky mess but in those official game awards it somehow ended up winning a lot of stuff but then when you actually go to like the people's choice when they had essentially a, you know their poll of like you know what do you the people think should win game of the year it was ghost of tsushima so it's like it's that it's that it's that same old thing of like when you actually let the you know when it's actually the people who are saying hey we like this movie or we like this video game it's going to be what is actually more in line with what the general people actually like and yeah. then when you just call these award shows it's just going to be the same tired old stuff that wins yeah and or the same lot- predictable stuff that wins yeah, and you know, going into the you know best director, and and again, going into best director, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson, Kenneth Branagh, Jane Champion, Ryu Shi. I'm hopefully I'm pronouncing this word correctly. I'm sorry if I am not. Ryu Shuk Hamaguchi, I believe, and Steven Spielberg are all like nominations, mm-hmm. and I just re- like, literally when he. One of the um, nominations that was snubbed was probably uh, Dennis Vumu. Again, am I pronouncing correctly? I hope so. But mm-hmm. yeah, like, where's the guy, you know, where's Dennis uh, Vinamu, who directed Dune? You know, where's, you know, Ridley Scott, who essentially directed two movies, you know, even even if you didn't agree with th- those two movies, you know, it's Ridley, you know, it's, Ridley Scott, he is one of the best directors of all time, and of course, watching his like drunken you know antics because of what happened with the last duel and House of Gucci, you know, at least you know give that guy some break. But yeah, mm-hmm. it's like the same thing where it's just like it's the same people who I probably would have seen regardless, especially since three of those people are famous, you know, famous directors and whatnot, and two of those people. I have not heard until just today when they uh, announced the the nominees. And it goes to what you were just saying before. A lot of it is just the same stale, what just works, uh, uh, what just works uh, uh, mentality for the Mm -hmm. academy. Exactly. It's like, you know, okay, Steven Spielberg. Yeah, that was expected. And then it's like they throw in one or two, usually with all these categories, that it's like, oh, we didn't expect that, to kind of give you that hope of, hey, maybe they're listening. And then the award show actually comes around, it's like, nah, they weren't at all. They weren't paying attention, really. No, not at all. Uh, so, yeah, going into uh, with Best Actress, uh, you have Jennifer, uh, Jessica J- Chastain, Olivia Coleman, uh, Penelope Cruz, Nicole Kimmon, and Christian Stewart. Now, what really struck me was probably Nicole Kidman for being Ricardo's. Mm-hmm. That's what we call the safe choice because yeah. th- that's like, like n- from what I've, I've seen of being Ricardo's, like the same thing with you know with Don't Look Up is that it doesn't look visibly appealing. And mm-hmm. a lot of my friends who actually have watched being Ricardo's have agreed that Nicole Kidman was not the best choice to play Lucille Ball. And mm-hmm. you could literally have any other actors play Lucille Ball and probably be a bad thing. And now she's also nominated for an Oscar for the movie. And again, like that's why I just said, you have the safe choice. Mm-hmm. Aside from Penelope Cruz, four of these actresses are essentially white actresses. Mm-hmm. And, you know... I did not see like any other like Lily. No, like if you look at the and and to uh, yeah, if you go into the next category, best actor, you have Hard uh, Heavier Bardem, Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch, Andrew Garfield, not for Spider Man, but for Tick Tick Boom, Will Smith, and Denzel Washington. Obviously, best actor is more uh, 
geared around like maybe person of color could war, uh, you know, compared to say best actress. Now with best actress, you could literally just replace Nicole Kidman with uh, say Rachel Zeiger from West Side Story, who I thought mm-hmm. would be a you know best actress uh, character, you know best actress uh, nominee, but yeah. no. But then also this goes to show that hey maybe these people didn't actually watch some of those movies like hey we're gonna give still Sue a a bunch of nominations we're not actually gonna watch his movie so we're not gonna see anyone in them but we'll give him the nomination you know so yeah it's like it's yeah it's it's weird and yeah but going going into support, supporting actor I mean supporting actor supporting actress uh. Which actually, both supporting actress and supporting actor both are actually tied together because both of the nominees in both uh, two nominees in both categories are like the first couple in like Oscars history, I believe, to actually be nominated essentially in, almost in the same category, which is huh. the supporting category. So hmm. Kristen Dunst and Jesse Plemons are both in the same movie, The Power of the Dog. Mm-hmm. And they are, yeah, they're engaged to be, you know, they're engaged to be married. So they're like the first couple in Oscars history to actually be nominated for essentially the same category of supporting. Mm-hmm. That, that's going to be really awkward if one of them wins and the other doesn't. Oh, yeah, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, looking at this is like, you have, you know, uh, like Ariana DeBose for West Side Story, J- Judy Dench, Kristen Dunst, uh, I believe uh, one, uh, someone from King Richard, I believe the, the actress who played, oh, okay, the actress who played uh, the parent to uh the um, the who's it called the the tennis sisters or the Williams sisters uh, mm-hmm. the mother to the Williams sisters there we go I think, mm-hmm. I, think I don't know uh, yeah it was okay just making sure mm-hmm. um, and you know as much as I love Judy Dench you know you could easily have uh, given friggin uh like someone else and uh, no, and i think this is probably what what's weird about these nominations is that aside from you know with how bloated the best picture nomination things is with 10 nominations mm-hmm. every other category aside from maybe a couple other categories are essentially just like five like every single category aside from best picture are literally like five five nominees and of course what's not and is and of course you know that will require the the academy to essentially you know adding more you know adding more nominations into these categories and what really should be inclusive is like adding more, you know, adding more care, adding more care, you know, adding more nominees to these things. So it doesn't feel like, oh, only five people, only five people, only five people, you know, uh, like best actor again, you know, Tom Holland should have been nominated for friggin' No Way Home supporting actor. Mm-hmm. Willem the Foe. I mean, there, and mm-hmm. there was a big push to have Willem the Foe be nominated for No Way Home because the same thing with uh, Alpha Molina. Mm-hmm. And of course, they're not there because there is again there was this whole stigma of of uh, superhero movies or just like fantasy movies in general or you know sci you know yeah fantasy sci fi movies in general mm-hmm. you know. And of course, you know, it's it's obviously something that's just not going to be like that because of just how these things work 
like 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 literally how these things work. Mm-hmm. And it's something that we just said, and it's something you pointed out before. It's not. It's like these people just don't watch these movies and just go, okay, you know, the, the you know, the, like these are the people that are being pushed for, you know, best actor or best, you know, best actress or what have you. Mm-hmm. But uh, with the best actress, I'm just glad to see Kristen Stewart to be nominated as a best actress, and if she does win, I hope she does win because. You know, Princess Diana is an amazing role to win for Best Actress, especially for a big movie like that. And I do hope Andrew Garfield wins for Tick, Tick, Boom. Hmm. But obviously, uh, everything else, I'm just like, especially with these big categories, it's just like, there's no stakes in, in, in terms of, uh, in, in, of the Oscars anymore. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's just like so predictable. It's like, it, it's why I've just stopped caring for a lot of these like award shows for so long because it's like, it's just going to be the same stuff that generally wins. And yeah. It's all just going to be like, yeah. Like, it's not actually going to be representative of like what the actual people wanted to watch and enjoyed watching. Like, looking into a best original score. There's Don't Look Up Again, there's Dune, which will probably win. Uh, or, well, in more seriousness, probably Encanto will probably win for best score. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, called... I, feel, I feel like it should, like, Dune should definitely win the visual effects one. Yeah. Because I think out of all the options that, that are there for that one, it absolutely had the best, by far. Yeah. I'm looking at Adaptive Screenplay, uh, Coda, Drive My Car, Dune, Lost Starter. Best, you know, Power of the Dog, original screenplay, Belfast, Don't Look Up, King Richard, Licorice Preacher, Worst Person in the World, you know, editing, again, Don't Look Up, Dune, King Richard, Power of the Dog, Tick, Tick, Moon. With editing, you know, I honestly don't understand sometimes what best editing, but again, I've done, like, editing like really, well, of course I don't understand editing. <laughs> I had this, I had this stuff, so of course I don't understand editing. But, but with, you know, when I read best editing, I just imagine people looking at these movies and going, okay, you know, all this stuff and all that stuff. You know, it's like what feels like a great movie, like what feels like a great narrative flow of sorts, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And it's like how much editing you know, knowledge, do they actually possess themselves? Yeah. Especially going into, uh... When they, like, decide, oh, which one am I going to vote for for best film editing? Yeah. Because, uh... I mean, I'm looking at these, and I'm like, you kind of have to go with Dune, though. Because if you're taking editing as a whole, it's not just, you know, oh, they cut this scene here at just the right time. No, editing is VFX. It's, and it's like all the amount of work that goes into that. Yeah. Because a lot of these are just look like, you know, they just like, you know, the standard kind of movies. And then there's Dune, which is super VFX heavy. Yeah. Like that movie is literally made essentially to be all about its VFX, essentially. Like, yeah, I know there's a story there, but it's like. Yeah. You're really going there just to watch all that amazing VFX and cinematography. And, like, going yeah, because it does look amazing. And going into v, uh, VFX, this is probably the last category. I, again, if we talk about every single category and every single nominee, we'll probably be here over two hours, and no one wants mm-hmm. to hear, like, a two-hour podcast of, of us bitching and moaning about, uh, about Oscar nominations and stuff like that, too. It's the same, and again, it's the same song and dance that we go through every single year of Oscar nominations. The last time I was actually, I actually gave a shit about the Oscars was probably a few years ago when Gary Oldman was nominated for uh, uh, his role as Winston Churchill. And then afterwards, I was like, I don't care about any other Oscars anymore, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and did he win that one? I don't remember if he yeah, won he did. Or not. Oh, good. Okay. I was so happy when I saw it, too, because it was like, it definitely felt like one of those type of uh, nominations where it does felt like, you know. He'll be like the Dark Horse one, where it's just like, you know, but then it's like, and there'll probably be something else to, um, to win. Okay, so, 
And this is the big category that kind of like has garnered a little controversy about about uh, the nominations. And, and this is something that should be essentially be booked into have more nominations into the Oscars. If they have like seven, if they have like maybe seven or eight nominations for each category compared to like the 10 category for like best picture, at least that's essentially uh, meaning halfway. Mm-hmm. Now for best uh, visual effects, you have Dune, Free Guy, No Time to Die, Shang-Chi and the Legend of Ten Rings, and Spider-Man No Way Home. And this is probably what I feel is the biggest controversy is that, you know, not only is it two Marvel movies, you know, I don't remember there was being that much special effects, visual effects, what have you, and No Time to Die. And I literally just watched it like maybe two weeks ago. It felt like the most... Like, like, pro- like probably that, you know, that missile blowing up that island scene. Oh, yeah. And that, probably, that's a big, that, that'd be probably like the biggest one that kind of sticks out. But yeah, like, yeah, it's like... Unless there's more visual effects going into it than we realize, because that probably is the case. Yeah, and or probably maybe stunt like stunts or something like that. Because mm-hmm. you know nowadays stunts are more like mindful to essentially uh, green screen and stuff like that too. But oh, yeah. Dune, as you said, Dune will probably win, mm-hmm. Dune, obviously because that yeah. looks. It, both- it, 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 yeah, that that looks like a visually a, a visually like expressive movie mm, that yeah like this is what it was made for it was made for like to be a visual spectacle like this so yeah th- i can definitely see that one winning hands down now i could easily have substituted no time to die with say godzilla versus king kong mm. that you know oh I visually don't... yeah it is it is great visually its story yeah. is <laughs> like you didn't even you don't even need a story you could literally just like chop out the story and just have it be just visual spectacle. Okay, you and me have to have words about the monsterverse. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, we will. When we have to talk about the monsterverse uh, TV uh, uh, TV series that's supposedly coming on uh, Apple TV uh, in sometime in the future, but about that, that's another day, another time. Like Free Guy, I understand. Free Guy mm-hmm. looks amazing as a visual spectacle. Mm-hmm. But oh, you know, some, when it comes down to it, they should have just boiled down to one Marvel movie, and maybe have added probably Justice League, the Snyder Cut, interdimensional effects because there is a lot of great special effects in that movie. Even mm-hmm. if you aren't like a big you know Snyder Cut fan and whatnot, you can't not agree that there is great visual effects in that movie. Oh yeah. Like, literally, if you want to, like, just go watch the Corridor crew having their VFX artist react segment to just the, you know, uh, Zack Snyder cut of Justice League. And, like, they, they, they're just, like, having the time of their lives with it because, yeah, it visually, with, with the visual effects, it is fantastic. Like, there's only one scene, like, it's so small, but they're, like, going, f- like, crazy over trying to figure out how it could have been done. Yeah, and to see, and and to see I, these guys like you know geeking out so much like that, it just shows like visually it was so well done. And again, yeah, it's a superhero movie, and of course, you know, it's like oh well, I mean, it we, it wasn't you know, it, it was a four hour thing, you know. It's like yeah, sure, it's four hours, but like again, it's like what you were saying. There was so much great visual effects work that went into that. Yeah, and especially when you compare that to the you know joss whedon's justice league which like took vfx and then decided to like just throw tomatoes on it hey now are you saying that uh them cutting out uh henry cavill's uh great mustache was a a, 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 a visual misstep <laughs> yeah that that they should have kept that mustache he looks great in a mustache he does but like so, watching Mission Impossible uh, Fallout with Henry Cavill, I'm like, that is a good mustache on that man. Yes, it is. <laughs> but, so they should have kept the mustache. Uh, now, I'm, uh, like, <laughs> I'm literally thinking of uh, stupid sexy Flanders uh, gag from The Simpsons <laughs> <laughs> with Henry Cavill and his mustache. <laughs> sexy. Stupid, sexy Cavill. <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, it's I... like, like so. Yeah, let's let's just like make a, a an Oscar not category just for Henry Cavill's mustache. Now that's yeah. basically what you can summarize from this whole like discussion from visual effects. Yeah, but honestly, uh, back to the thing, you, you could obviously have taken away either Shang. Well, obviously, Spider Man No Way Home will probably be the more suitable mm-hmm. category for best visual effects because they did a lot of love in that. And then, oh yeah, you know. Uh, but yeah, like take out I No heard... Time to Die, and then just like yeah, throw in something that spent so much more time with the visual effects for sure. You know, but yeah, it, it definitely feels like with the visual effects department, like literally the visual effects department of, of the act animated is just like literally just do a dart and like, OK, that has visual effects. That has visual effects. That has mm-hmm. visual effects. That has visual effects. There we go. It's like and one of so, the few times we'll see a Marvel movie get nominated for something. Yeah. Unless it becomes like unless they decide to really, really um, dare. Uh, a double down on that stuff. Mm-hmm. All right, from the best, obviously, we go into the worst, and <laughs> I, I say worst in in a loving manner because worst being well, there were bad performances and bad movies last year, so why not you know respect the hell out of it? Mm-hmm. The Razzies have put out their nominations, and ob- and obviously enough, they're doing the nominations. And awards show uh, the night before the Oscars. So uh, the Oscars is on March 27th. The Razzies is on March 26th. So Hayden, you had a great thought or comment when I showed you the article about the Razzies. Mm-hmm. And the big takeaway of the Razzies is that they added a new category for this year. And I do want to talk about that first category. It's a special category this year. Worst performance by Bruce Willis in a 2021 movie. And they gave it to him, and, and they have like eight movies <laughs> out, out of probably maybe the 20 he made over last year. I have no idea. Because he mm-hmm. made a lot of sh- like direct to video movies last year. Oh, yeah. Like people always, like people like always make fun of his like like almost stalemate like type of things to talk about like cookie cutter like literally cookie cutter direct video movies that he makes like literally he made essentially like almost like five movies of where it was basically the same plot mm-hmm. and I'm pretty sure there was even more movies of that mm-hmm. one two three four Oh, okay. He didn't make eight movies last year. Okay. (laughs) I was just making sure. (laughs) All right. So we have Bruce Willis in American Siege, Bruce Willis in Apex, Bruce Willis in Cosmic Sin, Bruce Willis in Deadlock, Bruce Willis in Fortress, Bruce Willis in Midnight in the Switch Glass, Bruce Willis in Out for Death, I mean Out of Death, and Bruce Willis in Survive the Game. (laughs) And at least... The bulk of his performances have literally been in the movie for five minutes. Mm-hmm. Like, Cosmic Sin is the only one out of I know where he actually has a main role. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, think, I think, like, everything I've heard and seen, for especially some of these, I'm like, I'm just like, first off, wow. <laughs> Bruce Willis, what's going on? Like, are are you like? It's like, yeah, like he's literally doing the reverse of Nicolas Cage. Yeah. Where instead of being selective, he's just like going for every single thing he can just to get the paycheck. Is he? Like, <laughs> are we gonna find out later? Later on, at some point, that he was probably involved in some pyramid scam, and it's only and that's why he's been doing all these movies to get the quick cash. Like honestly, well, if, well, if I'm right, <laughs> oh, no, no, not pyramid, cryptocurrency thing <laughs> well if i'm right about this uh half of those mo- uh, well, either the half of those movies or partly of those movies were made by the same people he knows mm-hmm. like so it's made by the same production companies made by the same producers he's friends with the same producers mm-hmm. 
He could literally just be in the same set and then walk over to probably another set and do this and do their movie like that's filming on the same thing. Like he doesn't even change out of the costume he was wearing. He's like, no, no, let's just go. I'm here. Let's go. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. It, it's sad to know is like Bruce Willis, like up until like maybe 10 years ago, had a good career just being, you know, in as a supporting actor or as a, you know, as a, like a supporting hero, a character, maybe a mentor or something like that. And now he's just like literally at the bargain bin of a Walmart or Target mm-hmm. or Best Buy or whatnot. whatnot. So, yeah. yeah. It's like, like what this says to me is that it's like instead of his career dying hard, it's dying with a whimper. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I had to make that joke. No. Anyway, well, let, let's do the action. And, and, and I will say which one I think should get it, because like you were saying, a lot of these are just like he's just maybe in for five minutes, and the cosmic sin is the one where he's actually in for a larger role, essentially. Yeah. So I feel like that should that should easily be the one that gets him the worst for his own category. Although, although worst performance actually probably just means the one where he doesn't really give a shit, <laughs> where you know he's just watching something. And that's well, I mean, what's, what's the thing? It's like, if he's only in for a couple minutes... Then you can just forget about it and move on. Yeah. But no, if he's in it for longer, that's going to stick in your brain for longer because he's in it longer. He's spending more time in it. Oh, yeah. Okay. So but I feel like, so because of that, I feel like it should go to Cosmic Sin. That's probably more true because he's actually given more of a, uh, uh, what's we call it? Uh, uh, like he spends more time in it. So, like he's give, so he has to give more performance in it. He has to emote more. So. <laughs> There's this thing called emotion, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, back to the actual categories of hand. I, we just needed to get the special category out of the way first, because that's actually first. Because Well, not first, but when the Razzies had their own special category all by itself, and it's just related to one actor, you have to stop with that first. Oh, yeah. All right. So, their best pictures are five, you know, obviously, and stuff like that, too. Now, their best pictures start with Diana and the Musical, mm-hmm. which is, again, Broadway. It's a, bro- it's a tape version of a Broadway show that was filmed just after the, uh, after the lockdown, mm-hmm. but right before performances started. So it was like, the, like a bubble between that sort of time period mm-hmm. for uh, Broadway shows. Because I know they had other stuff about that too, like other like other Broadway shows had their stuff filmed too around at the same time. Mm-hmm. All right, we have Infinite, Karen, Space Jam, A New Legacy, and The Woman in the Window for best a uh, worth. I almost said best picture, <laughs> worst picture. Out of all the movies I've heard for worst picture, probably The Woman in the wor- Window would probably be like the worst picture. Mm-hmm. Again, it's a Netflix movie that came out, but it, it it's like, it, from what I hear, it's sort of like a parody of a one of those, like, rear window, and this actually do bring a, and they actually say it's like a weir, uh, rear window uh, ripoff. Hmm. It's like a parody of one of those rear window type of movies where the main character sees a murder or something like that, and, but it's, ironically played straight mm-hmm. for some reason why i don't know it's like ugh. so yeah that, yeah it's it's like it's like you can do that rear window stuff like i remember they did that with um what's that movie with emily blunt um the girl, girl on the, the train the girl on the, the the girl on the train yeah i think it's called either something the, like that I think it's called The Girl on the Train, or The Girl on the Train from the Window, or something like that, yeah. Yeah, something something with, yeah, involving her on a train, and... Yeah, it's it, called The and Girl that, and, that, and that works perfectly, because of, like, the interesting story they built around it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's like, yeah. You know, what I, it, really said, it really says a lot when Netflix actually releases two of those type of things back to, like, back to back in the same year, where it's like, you have the women in the window... And then you have essentially a parody series starring Christian Bell called The Woman 
from across the street from the woman from the house or something like that. And yeah, it's like this long ass title. And when I first heard about it, I'm like, is this a parody movie? I'm like, oh, this is a show. Okay. But is this a parody? Because I don't read it as a parody. And then I find out <laughs> right as they debut the, the, the thing, I'm like, oh, okay, this is a parody. <laughs> but yeah, it's like when they decided to do two of those things, like almost back to back, I'm just like, that is hilarious. And, and, I, and I, I love that too, because it shows that it's like, okay, we'll make fun of ourselves. We get it. We screwed up. We, we messed up with it. So let's have some fun with it. All right. Go, uh, but yeah. So I think, yeah. I think I have to go with Space Jam A New Legacy. Yeah. Because the whole thing around it was just essentially trying to cash in on the nostalgia, throwing out all of, you know, the um, the IPs that HBO, Mac, that HBO has and not actually doing anything substantial with them. And I'm sorry, LeBron James. Like, LeBron James just is not that good an actor. Yeah, I know. Like I, that's I, kind of, that's that's kind of the downside. It's like at least he tried. Especially when you especially when you had um uh I'm blanking on the on the guy from the first movie. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. Yeah, he wasn't the best too, but he was at least giving something. Like you could tell he was actually reacting off more of like what's going on around him. So it was at least a little more engaging. And then yeah. It just felt At like too much like cash grab and uh, by trying to like use nostalgia. I, I will say this with Lee, at least for Michael Jordan, they built Space Jam around a commercial starring him and Bugs Bunny. At least that's how he mm -hmm. knew Bugs Bunny and all that stuff. But yeah, <sighs> but yeah, yeah, I felt like he was like yeah, I felt like he was ha actually having more fun with it. And LeBron James, I think, just didn't understand like what he was. I don't know. It just didn't seem like he knew what he was doing a lot of the time. All right. Speaking of but yeah, uh, Space Jam, uh, New Legacy, that's my pick. Speaking of LeBron James, who probably will win this category, worst actor, we have Scott Eastward in something called Dangerous, uh, Roe Hart um, Burr as Prince Charles and Diana in the musical, LeBron James, Ben Platt, and Mark Wahlberg in Infinite. Yeah, we're, we're probably on the same page. It'll probably be either LeBron James or Ben Platt as. Uh, yeah. Just the way he just ugly cries in that movie. Well, uh, also the fact that it's like they had to also then like essentially de-age him or oh yeah or have someone else. It was either de-aging or putting someone else's face over his face through like you know visual effects to like they can actually look you know like a high school teenager. Yes. <laughs> I yeah. so yeah, I think it's going to be tied between those two. It could go to either one of them. As opposed to using the person who's already on Broadway uh, right now doing the role, I think. But no, they decided to use Ben Platt because his daddy produced the movie. Well, I'm almost wondering too. It's like, be, like you know, because of um, like whatever the contract might have been for the musical, maybe they couldn't have gotten that actor because of that. Because that means he would have had to have stepped away from it. Yeah. From the musical to then go and do the movie. So it could have been something involving that too. But I'm pretty sure he are. This was like done like a few years away since he was, you know, uh, when the movie, the movie came out. So it's like uh, this was probably a few years after he was done with the role on Broadway. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's like that. Anyway, uh, yeah, he's probably it's either gonna probably be LeBron James, which is probably the 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 key, like probably a person who's probably gonna win versus mm -hmm. Ben Platt. Uh, yeah. ben Platt. So, worst actress, we have Amy Adams in The Woman in the House. We have Janine D. Wall for Diana Musical. Megan Fox in Midnight in the Switch Glass. Tara Manning and, as Karen and Karen. And Ruby Rose in Vanish. Or, sorry, Vanquish. And if I remember correctly, Vanquish is the one with that she plays with, uh, yeah, Morgan Freeman. Hmm. It's, some, it's basically some movie where she plays a ex-con or what have you and she's now as an uh, 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 oh, oh right it's like it's the one where it's like morgan freeman is holding i think her, it's like her daughter hostage yeah. and then she has to go and do all this stuff to like um for morgan freeman to then get her daughter back yeah it's like a like a like a like you like you've seen that movie plot line before but you know it's it, it's 
But from what it, I've seen, I mean, yeah. from, like from what I've seen in clips, he actually does a reasonable job because I will say that Ruby Rose is a, you know, capable actress. It's just that, you know, she just has a horrible past with what happened with Batwoman and stuff like that, too. Mm-hmm. So, and, yeah, like and, at, at times. It's, it, yeah. she, she's very much hit or miss, for yeah. sure. Like, if you watch something like, uh, say, The Meg, where she plays, like, basically uh, her, like, she doesn't have to put on, like, a like a forced American accent, like, which I really hate when they have, like, char- like actors and actresses who obviously speak in a different language, in a different language other than, you know, say, uh, English, and they have, like, you know, they speak British, or they speak Scottish, or they speak uh, German. They have this very forced American accent going on. But when you have someone who plays someone with a very naturalistic accent, like if it's their Australian or Scots or Greek or whatnot, and they're not playing a character like they're supposed to be American, obviously. But yeah, I mean, from what I've seen, she seems a very capable actress for that role. I mean, it's like one of those very by the book type of uh, action movies, especially mm-hmm. when you have to factor in she's playing a mother and stuff like that, too. Yeah, like yeah, like action stuff. She's good at. I mean, just you know, watch her in uh, John Wick too. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, I think she was doing a lot of her own stunts. If I remember right, for that one. And on and in Batwoman, you know, as much as Batwoman has, again, Batwoman's a different, uh, <coughs> different uh, argument or I mean, different discussion. When she does, yeah, that's a whole stuff, different animal altogether. That's a whole different animal. Well, <laughs> like literally a whole different animal. <laughs> <laughs> but. When you watch Batwoman, at least she does very good with the action stuff on that show. Mm-hmm. Even if you do notice, it's like, oh, it's like, you know, um, what's it called? Uh, stunt double someone. But yeah, mm-hmm. out of all the categories, again, probably Amy Adams. Yeah. Because, again, from my hear, she's like the, like, great actress as she is. Oh, my God, Israel. I, I just noticed it, too. I, and going into best uh, worst supporting actress, Amy Adams and Dear Evan Hansen. I legitimately forgot. <laughs> she would, that'd be hilarious. If not just her, also, but not just her, but also then Taryn Manning from. So it's like now Taryn Manning's in this one again for every last one of them. I haven't even heard of this movie. Same. I just saw the name. <laughs> it'd be it'd be hilarious if one of them ends up winning. Like the worst categories for both worst actress and worst supporting actress. Yeah, <laughs> you know it's gonna be. It'll probably go right down the middle with that one because with mm-hmm. Tara Manning as Karen, I understand like giving that as a as a worst actress, but with Karen, it's literally played like a parody of the whole mm-hmm. Karen thing. You have yeah. to watch the movie to understand it is a parody. Oh yeah, but, absolutely. But. I honestly see them like the Razzies giving both Amy Adams both worst and worst supporting actress. Just mm-hmm. on the but we should talk about the other nominees on the worst supporting actress. Of course, actors. yeah. Uh we have Sophie Cookson for Infinite. Uh we have essentially two actresses from Diana the Musical. We have Aaron Davy and Judy Kay, who is apparently uh so is apparently uh is essentially being booked twice as worst supporting actress as both Queen Elizabeth and Barbara Cartland. I don't know where she is. And of course, uh, Tara Manning in every last one of them. <sighs> as I said, it'll probably be, if they really do want to, they'll probably be Amy Adams for both characters. Yeah. Or maybe Amy Adams and then Tara Manning and, or Tara Manning and Amy Adams. Mm. So I, I feel like yeah, I feel like it'll be um, Tara Manning for the supporting, and then Amy Adams for the for the main. Yeah, that's my prediction. All right, worst actor. Ah, uh, poor Ben. And this is something. Oh, the worst supporting supporting actor. actor. Yeah, worst supporting actor. Ben Affleck, The Last Duel. Uh, <laughs> HBO Max actually put out a tweet about that, and go and it just has his face and goes to each their own. <laughs> 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 to each their own is like. Ben Affleck looking sad and it's like two weeks to you know. Yeah. At least HBO Max ha- has is having fun with the rising nomination. Oh, absolutely. All right, uh, Nick Ken in The Misfits, uh, Mel Gibson in Dangerous, and Jared Leto in House of Gucci. Uh, Gucci. Oh no! And, and did you say um, Gareth Keegan for Diana and the Musical? Oh no! 
Garen Ke uh, Keegan and Diana the Musical as James Hetf with the muscle bound hunk horse trainer. That's a mouthful. I'm not even sure if that's the actual t title for the character. Unless they decide. <laughs> Unless they decided to do it for the character, because that's what he basically is in the kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, horse supporting actor, I have no idea. Uh, yeah, like, I mean, th th these are all good picks. Like, it's it's hard to really like. It's hard Jared to pick Leto one. That it's hard to make the prediction of one of them because they're all good picks. Honestly, Jared Leto uh, to play uh, basically as Waluigi in uh, live action form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm. I'm split between him and Ben Affleck, if I'm going to be honest. <laughs> okay, so we just talked about before the Bruce Willis category. We have worst on-screen couple. We have oh, any clutchy cast member and any largely named, lamely named, <laughs> lyric size or choreographed musical number from Diana. <laughs> That's actually pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> LeBron James, any Warner cartoon character or Time Warner product, he dribbled on. <laughs> Gerald Leto and either his 17-pound latex face, his geeky clothes, or his ridiculous accent. Come on, accent. Come on, accent. Uh, ben Platt and any other character who acts like Platt singing 24-7 is normal. <laughs> Don't you just, you know, casually break out into song and dance when they run out of, like, the your bag of chips at the bodega? Yeah. And <laughs> and sadly, Tom and Jerry, a.k.a. Itching Scratchy, and Tom and Jerry the movie. I just said before, uh, Jerry Leto and his ridiculous accent, his Waluigi accent. Mm -hmm. I say Waluigi, but it is, like, literally Waluigi. I, I think I'll I think I'll make that prediction too. Well, either that or LeBron James. Uh, LeBron James is like, or again, yeah. flat. Okay, worst remake, rip off a sequel. We have Karen, an in 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 ad relevant remake of Cruella de Vil. How the hell did that happen? Uh, Space Jam, the new legacy, Tom and Jerry. Twist, a rap remake of all the twist, and the woman in the window rip off of Real Window. Honestly, worst remake and sequel, Space Jam. Obviously. Yeah. Because that, that, again, I like the film, but that's easily a cast grab. So. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Sure. And it's all those things, too, where it's like that one did garner much more attention. Like, Woman in the Window is probably even worse, but one of them garnered a lot more attention than the others did. All right, worst and not director. for good reasons. Yeah, I know. Worst director: Christopher Ashley for Diane and the Musical. Stephen uh, Cho Basai. I probably been, uh, I probably butchered the name. So I'm sorry. Chavosky, uh, I guess. Chavosky. Okay, dear. I, I guess. Coke Daniels uh, for Karen. Apparently, Coke is his nickname. Hmm. I, unless it, it stands for like. His two first names. I mean, his first name and his middle name. Rennie Holland for the Misfits and Joe Wright for the Woman in the Window. Hmm. Worst director, probably. Diane, not Diane. Uh, Dear Evan Hansen. Mm -hmm. Because again, Dear Evan Hansen is a Broadway production, musical, right? Yeah. Broadway production musicals do not really translate well onto screen. They rarely ever have. Yeah. And when yeah. they do translate well on screen, it's because it's usually made by the same people. Yeah. It, it's, it's like when you're um, adapting a book into a movie. You're going to get some things right, but then you're going to get a lot. Then people are going to be like, oh, no, you left this part out. I left this part out. It's like Perks Being Wallflower. It's a perfect adaption because it was made by the same guy who wrote the book. Yeah. All right. And... The last category we could talk about, worst screenplay. We have Diana the Musical, Karen the Mitzvitz Twist, and The Woman in the Window. Probably Karen. Just 
commercial. It's the way they like really, really scraped the bottom of the barrel of the whole Karen aspect of mm-hmm. of what is a Karen and what is everything else. But everything That's else. That's true. Yeah. And even that, even watching clips or watching how. Uh, not clips, but yeah, watching clips mm-hmm. of the movie and hearing how some of these the lines are, especially as a, a casual theater, a theater goer, it's like worse in a good way, but like it's just like written in a very, 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 really horrible way. Where mm-hmm. it's just like it, it really didn't feel like it, everything was like really written down, like in the maybe in like a two hour uh, run through of a running a uh, script. Mm. Ugh. Yeah, Karen is one of those things where it's like, it would have actually worked a lot better as like a short film instead yeah. of a full feature length, you know, level of production. Yeah, and again, Karen is something they did. And if you want to watch something like Karen that was done a little more better, watch uh, Lakeview Terrace with Samuel L. Jackson. It's the exact same plot of a of a guy, well, of a couple who who go into the neighborhood and they're Neighbor, played by Samuel L. Jackson, does not like him. You know, it's an interracial couple. You think it's an interracial, it's just because they're an interracial couple. It's more along the lines of, you know, Samuel L. Jackson just basically playing a crazy guy. Mm. And he's also a cop, too, so there's that. And it's actually probably done a lot more better because when you have someone like Samuel L. Jackson carrying the movie, you have Patrick Wilson, Zoe Sedal- uh, Sedea, mm. you know, in the cast as well. But it's also treated a lot, a lot more like a threat, where, again, Karen is played more like a uh, a parody of what a Karen is. Mm-hmm. And, of course, Karens are essentially a parody of, all by itself of the... Uh, oh, yeah. The, like, I've dealt with Karens a couple of times in my uh, former job. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's... But we've, a, we've all dealt with Karens at some point in our lives. Yeah. There's literally a scene where C tries to get these the, like people kicked out of the restaurant or something like that because, and she's calling up the phone. It's like, again, a lot of like from a script standpoint, it may be from a like a parody standpoint, but it just looks like it's it was just like written in a like two hour writing sesh for mm-hmm. a screenplay, and just yeah. like there you go, there's the screenplay. <laughs> we have to like we have to. Uh, we have to get this uh, movie uh, made in in like in uh, four weeks. Um, I have no time to uh, to do all this stuff. So it's like it's like bring out the coke and start writing. Yes. Uh, we joke about cocaine use on the show, but still, we do not condone the use of cocaine or any illegal substance. Exactly. And Unless that's it's weed, we just chill. Okay, that is true. Depending on what state you're in, be careful. And on that note, uh, that, that'd be a good way to end the episode. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, Oscars look very bland this year. You know, mm-hmm. obviously some safe choices. But the uh, Razzie's Award look like they're having fun with it. And Hayden, mm-hmm. any last words? Um, Just, yeah, pretty much just an agreement. Yeah, like... The Oscars just look as same and predictable, and I think it's just going to be the same predictable stuff that's going to win with that one. So, not much there. The Razzies, <laughs> I just can't get over the freaking Bruce Willis category. That is amazing. And truly, it feels like his life is going in the reverse of where Nicolas Cage is going now. Yeah. So, so yeah. And sad. yeah, the Razzies, I'm, it's, just, it's just great that they're just having so much fun with it, too. Honestly, with uh, to 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 end on a positive note, at least with the Razzies, the people who were not nominated for the Oscars are nominated this year for the the wrong reasons. But you know, yeah, you still got your nomination. Yeah, it's in the wrong. <laughs> it's, it, you know, it, it's not what you think it's for, but you know. I yeah. guess it's an honor just to be nominated. <laughs> uh, yeah. Take care, everyone, and please be safe, be well, and yada, 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 yada. Anyway, take care, everybody. <laughs>